first uh, part, I talked about that in Buddhism, when we talk about ethics, we look, talk about the way our mind works. There is, there is greed, hatred and delusion in our mind all the, all the time. Sometimes they have a lot of influence in our mind, sometimes they have little influence. So what we are doing, uh, what we are looking at in the, in the ethics of Buddhism um, is that we are looking at, uh, talk about what is right and wrong in Buddhism. It's mostly about how these three defilements, greed, hatred, and delusion are strengthened when we do something wrong and how they are weakened when they, we do something right. When they, we do something right, we tend to act on the opposites, the opposites of greed, hatred, and delusion. So this, these are things like uh, uh, generosity, kindness, wisdom, and these qualities, they, they make, they, they allow a deed to be good, to be, uh, to be wholesome. So when we are led in our actions by greed, hatred, and delusions, then a delusion, then that is uh, what we call unwholesome or simply put wrong. <laughs> and when we are doing something uh, good, then we are uh, usually led by the opposites of those qualities like generosity, kindness, and wisdom. So I talked about that even in, in psychology, there is a, the idea of moral reasoning. And in Buddhism, there is the idea of right view. Right view means that we have a certain perspective in life, a certain way of looking at life that helps us, to, that, that is uh, both realist and that, that, is, that is realist and it also is encouraging to do good. So in, according to Buddhism, if we are realistic about life, then we tend to also be, have, have an encouraging view. So I'll just give a few examples, okay? The first one is, we talked about is, the first form of right view is there is giving, which basically means that you believe that giving always brings good results. And it's a good thing to do and we should do it. That is the first part. So as you notice, these kind of forms of right view, they are all about, they all have a very moral character. That is because the first four types of right view, they are also about, all about principles in life to lead your life happily. But it also connects with the whole entire path to awakening or the path to enlightenment, which is so important in Buddhism. So the word right in right view, you can see here, in Indian language, in Pali language, it's samma, which is the same samma that we have in samma alahang that we use as a mantra in meditation. <laughs> um, I, Ian, if you don't mind, I'm just going to mute you for a moment. I'll, I'll, turn, I'll turn the sound off altogether. Oh, uh, yeah. That's okay, I, Ian, I, I'm, I'm okay. Yeah, so um, right view, Samma doesn't only mean morally right, but it also means that thing that is helping us to get closer to awakening, get closer to enlightenment, that helps us to awaken, that helps us to become enlightened. That is what we call right view or there is giving. Uh, the first one is, generally believed by most people, especially when you are motivated enough to come to a meditation center, to want to learn about meditation, it usually means you already believe that there is something like goodness, that there is something like giving, and that's important to do. The basic forms of goodness you believe in, because otherwise you wouldn't be joining meditation here in the meditation center or at home. Um, there is also another form of right view, which is there is sacrifice, which means that when we are able to help somebody, even if it's somebody who we don't know, then we should. This is something that is uh, an important form of right view. Yeah. It's 
it, it, it kind of presumes that when we do not help those who are in need, then it tends to feed back to us. One day, sooner or later, we will be in problems because we haven't helped the other person out. Not in terms of karma, but just simply the way society works. If you do not help the people in need, then eventually these people will, will be angry and they will be a problem in society. So there's always a balance in society that we need to help each other out. And then there is offering. I know in, 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 when we translate it to English, it sounds very similar all, but there is offering means in Buddhism that it's important to give honor where honor is due or to give credit where credit is due. So when we are uh, learning, practicing ourselves on the path of goodness and right view, then it's very important that we have, um, that we have heroes, that we have people who we respect and that we feel inspired to. It's also important to realize that when people are doing good, they often have to face many obstacles. So if we encourage them to do good, then that is also a very good thing to do. So it's not only about uh, honoring, like honoring uh, monastics or honoring the temple, but it's also about honoring uh, good people in general. When you see somebody do good, take good initiative, you want to help the person to do that. You want to encourage the person. You want to find ways to help that person. That is the idea of there is offering. You believe that it's good to give credit where credit is due. So if you see somebody take a good initiative, uh, sometimes it may not be totally perfect. There may be some, uh, some things that are not done well or something, but you still see the good in that person. Then we come to the fourth form of right view, which is uh, a bit more religious in a sense that it's about things that we cannot always see. Uh, that is the idea of karma. They are fruits or results of good and bad actions. Now, before we come to talk about that, it's important that we realize that why we are studying about right view, we haven't talked about that much yet. Why are we studying about this? Because right view encourages us to do good because it makes us more realist. But it's also about a concept in Thai Buddhism, which we call Rakbun uh, Globa, which means that you uh, like to do good and you are afraid or disinclined to do wrong. So this is about two things. There is uh, uh, the aspect of doing good and feel mod feeling motivated to do that. And there's the aspect of being afraid of being doing wrong. Now, very often when we, in Buddhism, when we, I mean, in Western society, when we talk about things like karma, then people will tend to think, of the, the priest or the minister who's shaking with his finger and saying, you shouldn't do that, you shouldn't do that, and comes up with a story, a fairy tale, so you feel, you feel afraid. This is kind of a, like a, a skeptic version of what religion is about. But uh, in reality, according to Buddhism at least, mor morality is not what uh, a priest or any religious figure, whether it's a monk or a priest, in any religion says from, the, from his church or from his temple or wherever, but it's a nature of life. So morality isn't just what people think, it's actually a nature of life, what we call the law of karma. So there's always consequences to your deeds. So in generally in Buddhism, we do not think that fear is a good thing, but fearing for the consequences of your actions is a good thing. So when we study about the law of karma, it's not about becoming uh, afraid in itself, but it's, it's becoming more careful of your actions. These are some examples of fear and when fear is not helping you. Last time I talked about the story of, uh, yes, yeah. please. Oh, I'm sorry to interrupt you. No, no, um, please. If you can go back to that previous slide. Um, oh, <laughs> sorry. which slide? It was the previous one that you just went, um, it was the very, it was the last bullet point. Um, yeah, just, just a moment. 
Yeah, and that one right there. So, the dangers inherent in the cycle of existence. So when, when in, in Buddhism, there is the subject of useful fear, there will be these two uh, bullet points. Fearing for the consequences of your action, fearing for the dangers inherent in the cycle of existence. This is actually about the, the very nature of life that there are sometimes uh, limitations to it. So we all grow old, we all become sick, we all die. There wow. is a danger to that that we should be aware of. Okay. I, I can talk more about that later, but it, this is actually a very profound topic. Yeah. yeah thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. So I talked last time I talked about the story of a, a boat um, which happened in the 19th century when there was a boat which stranded, um, which uh, um, this boat sank and uh, there were some people on the boat and they managed to escape on a smaller boat and then they were able to survive for a while and then they decided not to go to the closest island which because they they if they go there they would they were afraid of um, uh, cannibalists there was a story that there were cannibalists on that island which was probably not true but with, this is what the way people in the 19th century thought about many native people in different places in the world so they decided to go all the way back to america or all the way back to europe i forgot about the exact place yeah. and then they, they almost died in the prospect, all of them. And they actually started eating each other. Hmm. They became cannibalists themselves because their fear had brought them to that because they made the wrong choice based on fear from the start. So fear in itself in Buddhism and in any wise teaching for that matter is not a good thing at all. But in some cases, it's good to be afraid or to be at least be aware of the consequences of your wrong, of what wrong action might lead to. So that's why we study about the law of karma or study about right view to have a certain sense of carefulness in your actions, but also, and that's the other part that I would like to talk about today, to have the courage to do good, because this is also important it's not always easy to do good, right? I mean, you have all realized you've come here that there will be certain people that don't agree with you coming here. They will be making fun of you sometimes. That happens, mm -hmm. is that correct? I have to unmute yeah. you when I ask a question. <laughs> um, let's, let's just make a, a, a let's just, uh, I'm going to unmute everyone and please, uh, if you feel that you're making noise, just you can just mute yourself. That's okay. I used to do a, a online course with using Zoom and then everyone would, would mute themselves when they were not talking. Um, so you can also do that. But if you are very quiet and you don't have any background noise, then you don't need to do that. Okay, uh, let's just go back to the topic. So this is actually very important because religion or morality or any philosophical system shouldn't just be about doing avoiding wrong. It should also be about the courage to do good. And doing good in itself is, uh, is a very interesting topic to learn about. I've heard that many of you have now uh, decided to set up a group together to take the eight precepts, is that correct? Yeah, that's, that's a very good news, a uh, very good thing to hear. And I would like to rejoice in your good deeds for that. Sato. And uh, the eight precepts are not easy to keep, even if it's just once a week or once every eight days. So this is a very good thing to do. And uh, the eight precepts will help us in many ways in our lives. They help us to lead a more simple life. And they also uh, <clears throat> help us to get more focused in meditation. Now let's go back to the topic once more. And uh, let's just look at one more teaching. This teaching in Thai Buddhism is called, uh, I have to pronounce it correctly, Vesacharanakam. Vesacharanakam. <laughs> Vesacharanakam. Which means, uh, um, actually it's Vesacharanakam. That's the correct pronunciation. 
which means those qualities which uh, make us uh, encourage us to do good, to give us courage in doing good. And the first one is already a bit uh, difficult to learn about, right? When we talk about faith, this is a very difficult subject. Uh, but let me just explain first what I mean by faith. Oh, sorry. Faith in Buddhism, the most important part of faith in Buddhism is the confidence that your actions will always have consequences. Every deed is important. So you're starting to see why right view is so important here. If you have right view, you will always have faith that your good deeds will reap consequences. They will be influential. They will impact even if you don't see it yet. Every little good deed is important and we shouldn't look down on every little good deed. That's what the Buddha said. He compared it with water, with rainwater that drops into, a, uh, what do you call it in English? Drops into a, a, jar. a bar? A jar. A jar, okay. <laughs> that makes sense. A or jar. A cup. Yeah, when rainwater drops into a jar, eventually the jar will fill up. In the same way, uh, in, in, in doing good, we shouldn't look down on any part of doing good. So faith is about that part. There's also the part in which we talk about enlightenment, the enlightenment of the Buddha. But faith starts with the belief that your own actions have consequences, according to the law of karma, which we will study about now. There's also another number of other factors that uh, encourage, that help us to have courage to do good. Living ethically, being learned, uh, being somebody who likes to uh, have an effort uh, and being somebody who is wise. These are generally very important things. For example, if you are learned, you tend not to believe in things like fake news or whatever they would like to call it today and you are more careful in what you are afraid of. So you're not going to be afraid of, of things that are just hoaxes or something like that. If you live ethically, I just skip one. If you live ethically, then you also have courage to meet other people, to say your opinion, to do good because you've always kept your principles well. So you always stuck to your principles. When you've always stuck to your principles, then you also have the courage to do more good. Effort, when you always have effort, you're diligent, then you not, tend not to look down or you not, tend not to be afraid of uh, work uh, because you, you tend to you just, just go ahead and do it and then you are not going to be afraid of work. Wisdom always helps us to overcome obstacles. So that also includes fear. So wisdom helps us to distinguish what is right and wrong in any situation and wisdom is very helpful in also understanding the reality of life so when you have wisdom you will feel it's easy to do good because you know how to the way to do it you will know in any any given situation the right thing to do these are some examples but the most important one is faith i mean the most fundamental one that we start with and that's where uh, right view comes in. It helps us to develop faith. And, and, and right view and faith are very much connected. So right view encourages us to do good. And it helps us to avoid wrong as well. So let's talk a bit more about the law of karma, if time allows. <laughs> um, Let's just first ask the question, why are some people always unlucky and others always lucky? Have you ever wondered about that? Ian doesn't, you don't wonder about that? I, um, I don't believe that is the case. You don't believe that? Mm -hmm. uh, but there are some people that tend to have more bad luck than others. Is that true? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, but not all, you, well, so, I yeah. question the word always. Yes, you know? exactly. I'm going to mute it again. No, no, yeah, yeah, sure. You don't need to rush to do that. <laughs> it's just a, just a precaution sometimes. Yeah. 
Yeah, uh, so, so it's maybe I can reformulate a bit. Why are some people tend to be more lucky than others? Maybe lucky is not the right word there, but there is some difference in how people's lives are. So how should we describe it if it's not luck? Let me give you an example. Uh, let me give you an example. This is actually a story that's, uh, um, that's quite interesting. Her name is Vesna Vulovic. Maybe you've heard of her. She was actually a, a stewardess, um, uh, a female air host uh, in uh, um, a Czech, a Czech um, so that's in the east of Europe a Czech air, uh, what do you call it, airplane. Uh, so she was actually, airline. sorry, airline, airline, sorry. Airline. Yeah. She was in a uh, Czech airline and she was a uh, air host there, a stewardess. And she actually uh, uh, did her job there and there wasn't much of a problem. But one day there was one of the airplanes was hijacked and she was on it and it was bombed and the airplane crushed, fell down from very high above. We fell down from many meters. I think it's about uh, 10,000 meters, very high. But somehow she managed to survive. The entire airplane crushed, everyone was dead, except for her. They found her when they were cleaning up the airplane after the terrorist act was committed, they found her in a, you never guess where. In a, in a pond or something? Or water? Away from the plane. At the like back of the plane? <laughs> away, very far away. from the plane. Very in the water. Mm -hmm. yeah. in, in the toilets? Yes, exactly. And you probably read my lips there, don't, didn't you? <laughs> in the, in the, in the she was in the toilet. Oh, the, geez. oh in the toilet. She was protected by the, the, the kind of the room of the toilet, which somehow, oh, wow. you, B, you were also right. The toilet was, um, according to some versions of the story, the toilet was also moved out of the airplane or some way, in some way. And she survived the fall. Normally when you fall down from a very large height like that, very, very high, your lungs will explode. You're, the pressure, you can just not stand it. You, your body will suffer. But she did not because she had a problem with uh, blood pressure, with high blood pressure. And because of that, she fainted. <laughs> And because of she faint because of fainting early, the 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 fall didn't affect her much because she was already unconscious. Wow! And in that way, she survived. They actually did uh, investigated the the incident, and um, this is a, a very interesting story. And eventually, she was very handicapped. She was disabled, though her legs were up from the waist down. She her legs were very much damaged but she was able to survive uh, with her body met pretty much intact. And she actually became a national hero after that, actually helping to overthrow the, uh, the military government, which was in place at the time to change into a democracy. <laughs> her story is very interesting and it shows that some people always tend to have strange things happening in their lives. There's also, also a story of a, uh, an American man who was always uh, had lightning in his life. Maybe you heard of his name. He was a ranger. His name was Sullivan. And he always was hit by lightning wherever he went. He was hit by lightning about seven to nine times. A lot. <laughs> and he eventually he committed suicide. I don't know why, but apparently he had some problems in his life. So some people always attract suffering in life. You're right, Ian, it's not always, but it's more often than other people. Some people always very often attract happiness in their lives, or at least they seem to be protected. Why is this? According to Buddhism, this is where the law of karma comes in. Karma is a law, just like there are laws in physics, biology, psychology, there is also a moral causality, which has to do with our mind. 
<clears throat> the things we do, we say, and we think, they are called karma, kama. Kama and karma is the same. In, in Pali language, which is the language used in Southeast Asian Buddhism or South Asian Buddhism, Kama is, uh, is the language of Pali. That's the language used in South and Southeast Asian Buddhism. And uh, karma, which we use in the West, is actually from Sanskrit, which is more used in India and uh, is uh, used in, uh, um, uh, in East Asia, in Buddhism from East Asia. So the things we do say and think are called kama. The result of those actions is called the ripening of kama or vipaka. In Thai language, the first one is called kam. And the second one is called vibakam or the result of karma. So vibakam, to translate it directly, is the ripening of karma. So we just continue with the spelling in, as it is used in the West, karma, so not to con get confused. So this word is abused a lot. There's actually uh, has been a, a lawsuit in, in, in America from some uh, Hindu organizations who felt that the word karma was being abused by certain companies, for example, those who produce a karma perfume or something like that. Because it's actually a word that is used in many uh, Indian religions, including Buddhism. So karma basically just means what you do. It just basically means action. And the ripening of karma is what we call uh, vipaka or pala, pala. So when we say karma, we tend to confuse these two things. We tend not to distinguish between what you do and what the result is. Sometimes we just confuse karma with fate. So somebody is always unlucky, like the guy, the ranger I just mentioned, Sullivan. He's always hit by lightning and therefore we say he has bad karma. That is actually the result of karma. If that is the cause, that is the reason. Can I? Yes. Um, Please ask. Yeah, I, I always thought that there are things that can happen to somebody like the ranger who was struck by lightning many, yes. many times that are really just random and not as a result of anything that person has done or said. Um, right. You know, I, I, I thought there were kind of, um, I thought Buddhism allowed for good and bad um, things to happen to somebody, but not as a consequence of anything that they've done, sort of more. Yes, sometimes. Out, out, in other words, you happen. can have something bad happen to you, but it's outside of the law of karma. Is that, is that not the case? Sometimes some things happen because of the karma we do right now. Some, there was one time when somebody wrote uh, to our abbot in Thailand, what karma has caused me to be so far away from the Thai temple, the temple in Thailand? I went to Japan and what karma has caused that? And the abbot simply answered, well, you went to Japan. Mm. So sometimes the things we do right now is the cause. It's not about the past or something like that. Uh, so she simply made the choice that she'd like to go to work in Japan. And that's why she's more distant from the temple, at least physically distant. But that was not a problem, but it was a problem for her. And then the abbot said, well, you made that choice yourself. So some things are chosen right now in the present by us it's not always mm. about the past sometimes we are simply for example if we suffer from bad health it may just be because we eat the wrong things <laughs> it may not be because we had bad karma from the past but sometimes it may be both but, it but it, is be, it yes but is it is it also more. true that sometimes it's neither Well, I mean, what I mean to say that there are certain things in life which were caused by what you do right now. There are certain mm. things in life which are caused by what you did in the past. They may also interact. Some things may happen to us 
um, that make us suffer because of how we respond right now. Sometimes, for example, they may actually be wise people on your path, but you don't recognize them as wise. And so you feel frustrated about that. That's your current karma. That's your current suffering caused by your current response. But if in generally in Buddhism, if, if, if suffering comes into our lives, there must be a cause. There is always a cause. Things don't happen without a reason. There may be certain coincidences like this number agrees with that number. It's not like Buddhism encourages us to look for conspiracy theories everywhere or look for signs. I'm looking for signs. No, but Buddhism does say that everything that happens in terms of suffering and happiness in our lives has a cause. So, um, that, that is something that, that is important about the law of karma. Yes. Oh, uh, Venerable Sanders, do you mind if I ask a question? No, I don't. So um, one thing to support, I was watching a YouTube video and an article this past week um, about, and it actually talks about quantum mechanics and um, how quantum me mechanics actually supports karma. And um, they were talking about it, not to complicate this thing, but it's talking about the wave function, which is basically these individual invisible fields that are not detectable. And um, how they've done, if you ever actually Google the double slit experiment. Yeah, I, I'm aware of that. Actually, that is part it's of- very this, fascinating. That, that, yeah. That's actually part of this, this, this course. Uh, okay. I use that example uh, and when I talk about the, the karma at a later point. So it's interesting yeah. that you, you, you raised it, exactly the same example as I, as I intended to. This experiment shows that there is actually the science does recognize the influence of the observer on the observed. Yeah. So, and, so and there's also a part where the individual photons, which is kind of interesting, yeah. is they talk about light and um, they did an experiment with, and this is a real experiment. Uh, it's actually, they've done it many times, and there's a guy named Veritasium. He's a, he's a Canadian physicist. He's probably in his very young person. I think he's probably 31, 32 years old. He, he went to, I think it was in the University of Toronto. They had a photon generator, and they actually simultaneously with the same, right. amp, with the same frequency, they hit with a photon generator through two slits. So if you think of a photon generator, it's, it's hitting individual light particles, and you'd expect two dots on the, on the receptor. But what happened was when it went through, it went through these waves. The waves are individual, they're indetectable energies of potentiality. So potentiality mm -hmm. is essentially, and, and what is potentiality? Potentiality is like, well, they're explaining its, its potential of where it's going to go. So when actually when the light particles go through, it follows the same patterns as if it was just natural light coming from the sun. It's, it's, it, it followed the same pattern. Oh, watch this. It was amazing. But anyway, that's not to, it, it so supports. The, the double slit experiment shows that the, once we observe something, we look at something, we're already affecting reality. Yeah. This is, this is not the way they would, they would describe it, but that's the way I, I conclude from it. Okay. That's so, the, there's two versions of uh, one is the, the objective observer, and then the one is the, there's two versions of it, um, okay. and they both work out mathematically. So basically nothing exists until you actually actually observe it, which is- It exists, these, but it, it hasn't been, yeah. it's not existent in one clear decided state yet. Right. So it, hasn't, it hasn't collapsed the wave function is what they say. Right. <laughs> Only when you observe it, it collapses the wave function and it is visible. Wow. Yes. This, this connects very much with what I'm about to say. Um, just a moment. Uh, so what I was about to say, uh, I just I just blanked this uh, this this slide so you cannot see it. <laughs> but anyway, um, what I was about to say, I already said in the first. Uh, part of this teaching, so that's why it's not in, the, in here anymore, but it's very important is that uh, once we, uh, um, our suffering follows our mind, 
when we do when we think with the wrong mind and happiness follows our mind when we think with the right mind so there is always an effect of our mind on society on on the, the world around us so that's the also the fundamental idea of karma is that we are affecting the world around us all the time even if we don't notice especially when we act out of uh, good qualities or bad qualities for that matter in our mind so when we do something out of greed hatred and delusion or when we do something out of wisdom out of generosity kindness or any other example that i can give forgiveness our um, uh, wisdom, uh, reason, thinking. These are all examples of uh, when we are acting in a moral way, according to Buddhism, and that's what we call karma. So it's, it's, it's not something that uh, it's generally recognized in science that our mind can affect the surroundings around us. And that's why even in quantum physics, this is not clearly concluded yet but there is a conclusion that there is a connection between the observer and the observed, which is very much in the same uh, subject, same idea, similar idea to what Buddhism says. So what we call morally right and morally wrong, I already discussed about that, I already talked about that, but now I'm saying that all of these things continually affect our lives because when we do wrong, we attract suffering when we do right, we attract happiness. This is the basic law of karma. Karma ripens in the here and now. So when you do something wrong, it may just uh, immediately have an effect or quite quickly have an effect in your present life. When you do something good, you're always, for example, encouraging people through your words. You're encouraging people. You, When you see somebody who tries to do good, you encourage them, you try to help them. That will affect your life maybe in the present already, yeah. in the present moment. It may then, some part that we do may carry over in the next life. Some parts of what we do, maybe many things that we do carry over in the next life. There's also an element that I should notice that whenever we do something, it's not just some, like that thing comes back in kind once, but it comes back in kind many times. So when we are, for example, to give a negative example, if we gossip about people, then people might gossip about us for maybe 10 times, 20 times, many times before that karma is exhausted. So karma will at a certain point ripen when it obtains an opportunity and it will also become exhausted. That's not mentioned here, but it should be. It becomes exhausted. So karma will not always exist, but it will at a certain point become exhausted. Yes. Uh, quick question. Uh, you said that uh, I just want to make sure I understand correctly that the karma that when it does ripen, it's, it's actually heavier than the karma that you originally did. Because yes. like you said, you gossip, then it, that gossip is even more heavier and it can last longer. So does that mean it's actually it's heavier? heavier? But it, it may occur many times. So that doesn't really sound uh, fair. Yes, exactly. The law of karma is not fair. That's an important thing to take away. Buddhism does not believe and has never believed in a just world. So every one of you who thinks that Buddhism teaches in a just world, <laughs> you, you can think again, it doesn't. And there is no, thing, no justice in karma. And that's why a Buddhist, uh, a Buddhist might believe that somebody who's born in a poor country is not justified in being poor because that person has not given in the past, but must also be helped. That's why when somebody, and I know this is very controversial, but I have to mention it. When we say that somebody is disabled because he's done something wrong in the past, that doesn't mean it's justified. There is no justice in karma. 
it may be that we are not aware of something. Maybe some people will kill an animal because it's their profession to do so. Some people, might, some person might be a farmer and has no other job opportunity in, a, in an agricultural society. He will kill animals and he will be reborn as a disabled person. That is not justice, but it's the way karma works. That's why the Buddha, he did not intend to praise karma, but he actually intended to attain enlightenment, to be free from karma. The goal of Buddhism is not to praise karma, but to be free from it eventually. But as long as we are still in this world, in this life, we can use karma to the best of our ability and for our happiness and the happiness of other people. So karma is not justice, but we can use it in a way that it creates happiness for ourselves and others. The good karma, Lumpy, is, please tell me it's about the same in terms of if you do something good. Yeah, that's right. The results are just as good coming back. Yes, yes. Okay. So when you, when you are generous to somebody, even if it's uh, your neighbor, it will come back to you maybe 10 times or maybe many times. Karma is always more times than you originally did it. Yeah. And uh, so uh, it, it's become stronger even if you do a good deed to somebody who's very, uh, who you are in debt to, for example, indebted to. For example, your parents have done a lot of good for you, right? I know this is a bit controversial subject for some people, but in generally, we all have to admit that our parents did a lot of good for us, did a lot of effort for us to be born in this world and to take care of us. So when we do something good back for them, uh, from this intention of gratitude or from this intention to do good for somebody who's been so good to us, then that is an even more powerful deed than being generous to your neighbor. Unless, of course, your parents are your neighbor. <laughs> So um, this is uh, um, about intention as well. So when we go back to the subject of karma, it's always about intention. The Buddha, he said, karma is intention. So karma is always something that also must be ripened for the person who's done it. We cannot give it to somebody else. It's not like we can say, well, I just give it to you and uh, I hope it's not going to affect me. We can't do that. The same way, good deeds, we cannot, uh, people cannot do them for us. But there is a subject which we come later to, which is called the sharing of karma or the, 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 the sometimes it's called the transfer of karma. Sharing of karma is uh, a bit um, uh, complicated to explain. I'll explain more later. But in terms, in generally in karma, it's said that we cannot, nobody can else can do good for us. Nobody else can do wrong for us. We are the deodora of our own good deeds and we have to receive the effects, the fruits of those deeds. So there is a story in the time of the Buddha of some uh, relative of the Buddha whose name was Super Buddha. He was also, his name was also partly Buddha, but it didn't mean the same as, <laughs> as in the Buddha's case. Super so Buddha sounds name, really important. Sorry? I said Super Buddha sounds really important. Upa Buddha. Upa, okay. Uh, it, it, you have to realize the word Buddha is not the name of Siddhartha Gautama, right? It was the title that was given to him. It, <clears throat> it basically means awakened or wise. So in this case, this man, by chance, he had a similar name, but, <laughs> but he was not the Buddha, of course. So his name was Super Buddha, and Super Buddha was not a very wise man, unfortunately. So uh, one day, he offered his daughter in marriage to the Buddha. And the Buddha, of course, refused. We have to realize that at that time, celibacy was still a new thing. It wasn't widespread in Indian society uh, as it is now, or as it is generally known as a custom all over the world these days. Celibacy is, is pretty much invented in India. 
and um, it was at that time still new. So Super Buddha didn't understand that part. He just gave his daughter to the Buddha. He wanted to give his daughter and the Buddha refused. He said he, he, he could not accept that. So he was angry about that. One day the Buddha was about to go for arms round. He was about to, to go and walk and see some lay people. And then Super Buddha blocked him. He was sitting there in the street and he didn't allow him to pass. So the Buddha returned back home, back to his temple. And then uh, Super Buddha, because of that, uh, somebody asked the Buddha, what will be the karmic consequence that Super Buddha has done this to you? And uh, then he said, well, one day he will be uh, he will die and he will be like, uh, he will, will die as a consequence of what he has done. There's nothing that can be done about that now anymore. And then uh, Super Buddha heard that and he tried to flee. He tried to flee from that place. He tried to find a, a way to flee from that bad karma because he believed that what the Buddha said was true, but he couldn't flee from it. And eventually he did die. So, this shows that there's always a consequence of everything we do. It's just, I know these examples are very dark, but there's also a positive side, of course. Uh, whenever we do something good, nobody can steal it from us. When we do something good, nobody can, they may criticize, people may criticize us, but they, they can never take away the good things that we've done. So that's, the good things are rewarding in itself and help us and give us happiness. And we can share this happiness with others. Nobody can steal that. And uh, we, we will always carry that with us until those, that karma is, and even if that karma is exhausted, it will still affect our character. So everyone who does good or bad will always have the results of that. It cannot be fled from, but there is the possibility that we do good to delude the bad things that we've done, the bad karma. That is possible. So it will still have an effect, but its effect will be more spread out. It will be less strong. Yeah. In the same way, when we have done a lot of good in the past, but we do a lot of wrong in the present, then the good deeds will also become diluted and they will not affect our lives that much and they will not bring as much happiness as they could have. So good deeds and bad deeds always interact with one another. This is about the law of karma. There's always this interaction and this influence. So um, this is some principles about the law of karma. Hmm there's still a lot to learn. For example, I just mentioned that it carries over in the next life, karma, it carries over in subsequent lives. These are also concepts that we haven't learned about yet. Well, not in my teaching, at least. Uh, there's a, start a lot of funny jokes about it, actually. Many people in the West think it's kind of funny. <laughs> this guy, he says that he will leave my, his last will and testament to, him, to himself in the next life. And all of his... All of his relatives are not so happy about that. <laughs> so when we are learning about karma, there's a lot to learn about. And again, I will tell you that all of these things the Buddha taught without the intention to force people to believe things. Because even if from now on, we will say a thousand times a day that we have to believe this, it will still not be a belief. We cannot enforce a belief on another person, even on ourselves. Faith and belief will arise when we observe and do good. So when we do good and we see the consequences happening in our lives, then faith, confidence in goodness will arise in our lives. We may also see the example of other good people who do good and therefore have confidence that goodness has good results, good deeds have good results. But it always starts with observation and wisdom, and that is how faith and wisdom always interact. So 
when the Buddha taught about faith, faith or sata in, in the ancient Indian language, Pali language, he also, also always mentioned panya, which is wisdom. This was already observed by some early uh, Buddhist scholars that sata or faith and wisdom, they always go hand in hand. Whenever the Buddha mentions one, he also mentions the other. In Thailand, this is usually also, uh, uh, this, this observation has also become um, uh, well known because of the teachings of um, uh, Payut, Payuto, who has um, who's also uh, been teaching this observation. So when we are um, uh, having talk about faith, it's never blind faith in Buddhism. It's just a leap of faith starting from some basic observation, from some wisdom. And then we know that, okay, when we have seen so many good things happen because of what of the good things that have been done, then we are, we are taking the risk or taking the challenge to do more good. So we have, there is a leap of faith, but it's based on something. So this is the idea of faith and the, 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 the idea of karma. What the car, law of karma is not. Do we have time for this? I don't think we have. <laughs> Maybe next time. Maybe next class, Lumpy. And uh, people might have some questions too. Uh, yes, please do. Questions?